you never know that your auntie is being taken away in chains to be done. Horrible things will be done to her by whoever buys her somewhere else in the realms. And this, this evil is under our boots at all times. <laughs> I'm Ivan of Many Realms, and on this episode of Realms Lore, we're talking all about Skullport. On the third level of Undermountain and far below Waterdeep, Skullport is also known as the Port of Shadows. While still incredibly dangerous and largely run by gangs, Skullport could be a great launching point for your next adventure, and it still holds quite a bit of mystery, which Ed Greenwood is here to help us explain today. And if you love learning about locations of the realms like this directly from their creator, consider becoming a supporter on Patreon, where you'll get so much exclusive access to realms lore, it will blow your mind. Let us assume that you live in Waterdeep, or you're visiting Waterdeep, and you hear somebody mention Skullport and say, What by all the gods is Skullport? And half the tavern, or eatery, or club, um, enlightens you. So it's the people who do live in Skullport who are telling you what Skullport is. To the vast majority of citizens who've never set boot anywhere near Skullport and never intend to, who live on the surface, live out their busy lives in this busy, bustling city, to them, Skullport is uh, underneath their feet. It is the den of utter iniquity. They think of Skullport as a place where you can get poisons, monsters float or slither or stride up and down the streets. It's dark, it's underground. You can buy anything there. And some people in Waterdeep, some Waterdavians, as they call themselves, even believe that Skullport governs Waterdeep. Like the Xanathar is down there. Beholder Crime Lord is down there. And there are other horrible critters down there, Aboleths, illithids slash mind flayers, uh, liches who come out at night, <laughs> who live down in Skullport, and they control the guilds, they control the nobles, or they control the masked lords, or some of them maybe are members of the masked lords, and this is all being kept from the rest of us as a great dark conspiracy. So, Skullport is where slaves are taken. People are kidnapped right off the streets of the city and taken down there. And then, through something called the Sea Caves, they are smuggled out of Waterdeep without going through the Waterdeep Harbor and the port that we know, and shielded from everybody's gaze by the sheer mountainous bulk of Mount Waterdeep. Ships come and go and reach Skullport, and you'd never know that your auntie is being taken away in chains to be done. Horrible things will be done to her by whoever buys her somewhere else in the realms. And this, this evil is under our boots at all times. That's the sort of stereotypical wa Waterdavian belief of what Skullport is. And they're not far wrong. Just about everything I've said is true. The question is, What's it really like to be down in Skullport? Is it what they're thinking it is? And of course, like everything else, if you don't know, your imagination fills in the most salacious and the worst details. When you're hearing about Skullport, you're trading stories with the guy who's been drinking too much next to you in the tavern tap room. So anything sensational, really funny, really violent, really weird, is going to get spoken of. So... What is Skullport, really? Ah, you have to go there to find out. <laughs> so now that we have the extrinsic view of Skullport, mm. I'm curious about the peoples of Skullport and what a life might look like to somebody that spends the majority of their time there. Are there residential districts in Skullport, or is it primarily just kind of a, um, I guess, a merchant's hub? Skullport's population isn't that large. So there are... There are um, if you're thinking of suburbs or housing developments, no. Skullport just grew, and it just grew in caverns that were down there largely carved out by rivers. And the buildings here in Skullport, because real estate is valuable in this confined space, the buildings tend to, on the ground floor, have some sort of business use, a shop or a factory or a warehouse or whatever, and then above them, 
people will live in small rooms. And Skullport is also known, and this is different from Waterdeep right above it, it has many catwalks. By catwalks, think think those um, rickety Indiana Jones movie type rope bridges, <laughs> you know, where the, there's a bridge made of logs with rope side handles and so on, um, crisscrossing above your head. There's a web interconnections above the street level. So Skullport is filling up a lot of the cavern that it's in. And it's very damp in Skullport. And if it weren't for the uh, giant fungi growing everywhere, um, some of which glows and, and clings to the ceilings of the caverns and therefore gives a weird half-light at all times, even when there isn't a light source near you, if it wasn't for them soaking up moisture and off-gassing breathable oxygen, by the way, um, Skullport would rapidly become untenable. The other thing that people in Waterdeep might have heard of is the flying skulls of Waterdeep. That Skullport is policed or governed by human skulls with burning eyes that fly around and, and can spit out spells. As in, they don't cast them like a wizard might. They open their mouths and the spells jet out. In order to preserve some mystery, and therefore some DM elbow room, I'll just say that some of what you may have heard about the skulls is true. <laughs> and do, did those have a specific narrative function? And you could tell me a little bit about, I guess, maybe where the inspiration for the flying skulls of Skullport came from? I just had this uh, vision in class when I was five years old, and I was waiting. I was writing, starting to write Mert short stories, and I was waiting for Mert to get to where the flying skulls were. I knew they were in a huge underground bustling settlement, but I didn't know anything else about the settlement at that point in my in my tiny little mind. I was just jotting it down, thinking, oh, it'll be fun when Mert gets to the skulls, and he's going to argue with them, and, and then he's going to think he can outwit them, and then they're going to open their mouths and spit magic at him, and he's going to get <laughs> real respectful real fast. <laughs> um, and that's, that was the inspiration. But let me just say that the reason nobody has ever sort of taken it over and made it their fortress is the flying skulls stand in the way of, say, drow or slavers or smugglers or the Xanathar Thieves Guild or whatever. The reason why no one power group, faction, whatever you want to call it, has ever taken over Skullport and governed it is because they run into the fact the Flying Skulls don't want it that way. So it stops right there. Which keeps, actually, Skullport very useful for everybody. But that's and that's another thing. You rent safe storage space down in Skullport. And they will keep your secrets for you because that's what they do. So Skullport is a center of mystery. And the Dungeon Master should use it that way. Wah! <laughs> So, uh, I think that astute fans of the realms will know that Skullport is actually built upon the ruins of a Netherese settlement. And I'm curious if you might be able to tell us what that Netherese settlement looked like before it was ruins. Sure. That Netherese settlement wasn't a floating city. It wasn't a high magic center. It was part of low Netheril. You know, the, the floating cities and the snotty arcanists and so on, they were high Netheril. Low Netheril was the Netherese people who, the working class, the underclass, the poor, the ones who labored doing farms for the Netherese up above. And what Skullport was, was a fungi farm and experimentation thing for certain Netherese arcanists who were interested in seeing that if they could treat subterranean fungi with the right spells, whether they could augment it or improve it as foodstuffs. So, for instance, it would have a nice taste rather than tasting of bland fiber. These arcanists, they were using magic to see if they could make this stuff grow faster, grow larger, as well as improved. And the other thing that was happening is, well, they wanted to do really dangerous magical experiments here, but they didn't want somebody else to know what they were doing, like a rival arcanist. Well, if you create your weld explosion on the surface, you, you sort of alert everybody else on the planet to the fact that you're blowing up something. Well, if you don't <laughs> want to alert them, you blow it up in a cavern underground. And then somebody is bound to blame the dwarves or the Dergar or whatever, uh, rather than you, because no sane person would ever 
let off explosive spells underground. Only idiots do that. And no arcanist <laughs> is an idiot. Um, yeah. Nethery's arcanist with sufficient power would try stuff out in Skullport and other places, other underground subterranean caverns, but Skullport was one where they sort of all came together and it had a flowing water source, the river. So you could sustain life there and the fungi were already there and they were already experimenting on it and so on. So that is largely what the Nethery settlement was. It was a working settlement. You might call it an experimental farm and a working farm as well because the bits they weren't experimenting on, they were harvesting fungi for and sending it up to the floating cities by various magical beans. It would be a mistake to think of the Nethery settlement as this ancient, many-towered wonder of arrogant arcanists striding around being wealthy and powerful. No, they were elsewhere. The workers were down in Skullport working. Do you think that adventurers traveling to or through Skullport are going to be getting a relatively decent idea of what the rest of Undermountain is like? And do you think that that's kind of part of its narrative purpose um, in people traveling from Waterdeep to, I guess, less safe and more adventurous vistas? <laughs> hmm. You, Skullport isn't the same as the rest of Waterdeep, just as base camp for climbing Everest uh, is nothing like being up on the mountain alone, particularly at night or when the weather's bad. When you're out in the rest of Undermountain, yes, parts of it can be very populated and very dangerous and very busy, but you're basically exploring on your own, whereas Skullport is sort of like the supply center. But that supply center was full of thieves and crooks who were telling you tall tales about being up in the mountains that, unless you've been up in the mountains long enough, you don't know aren't true. Guys selling you charms to ward off monsters that they swear are there and telling you things the monsters will do to you that they can tell you have done to many times before. And of course, if you've ever met one of those monsters, you know that this is all, let me say, be polite and say, flibberty gibbet. <laughs> so with Dungeon of the Mad Mage coming out, I think that fans of D&D, uh, both long time and new, are getting kind of a new introduction to Undermountain. And I think that that's very in keeping with Halister Black Cloak's, I guess, uh, representing of of Undermountain, it just keeps getting crazier and crazier and crazier. So I'm curious if the, I guess, uh, if the original conception of Skullport had it uh, under control of Halister Black Cloak, or if his influence hadn't necessarily gone that close to Waterdeep. Oh, no. Uh, Halaster was everywhere. He could have influenced it, but he didn't want to. Uh, Halaster was a loner. I don't mean that he avoided everybody. He had apprentices and everything, but he liked to meet people on his own terms. And he hated crowds, and he hated noise, and he hated chatter and hubbub, all of which meant he wouldn't go near Skullport if he didn't have to. Much is made of the fact that Halister's crazy, but he's brilliant, and he's cunning, and he's crazy. In other words, Halaster is quite brilliant and perceptive and lucid most of the time over many things. And one of them is he realizes if there's going to be lots and lots of people, they will need a, a, a relief valve, a safety valve. They will need that supply center. Adventurers get to understand that if they're down to like two party members badly wounded and they're dragging the bodies of their dead friends, <laughs> Skullport <laughs> might be a place if they can possibly reach to get healed and get their friends raised and so on. So it it's very important. And Ha Halister did not necessarily, other than spying, you know, just watching who came and went from Skullport, because it says, oh, I think I like to jump on this one. Um, <laughs> other than that, he just let Skullport be. So he could influence it. He just didn't bother most of the time. Now, do not think if you are an adventurer or a water Davian who's using Skullport for safe storage and the occasional purchases of poison or drugs, stolen goods, or wants, do not make the mistake of thinking Hal Aster doesn't notice just anything he wants to notice. He might not notice some detail of what you're doing, but that's because he was busy noticing something else, not because he doesn't notice what he wants to. He notices everything he wants to. So don't think that you're managing to do things without Halister knowing. He knows. <laughs> I feel like for as dangerous as it is, Skullport has also kind of taken on 
the reputation and the purpose as a sort of respite, as you were saying, for, you know, adventurers that have maybe ventured too deep into Undermount and want to get back to some point of not necessarily safety, but familiarity. Uh, you know, keeping that in mind, I guess we get to the, the final question of the episode, which is, if you had one thing that you wish everybody knew about Skullport, what would that be? And whether that be uh, to improve their games or to make it uh, a richer narrative experience for them. Okay, here's the thing about Skullport. It's far more diverse than Waterdeep. Creatures like Drow, like horrific monsters, like the Deformed, who don't feel comfortable or wouldn't be accepted or would be shunned or treated badly on the streets of Waterdeep, they end up in Skullport if they want to be near Waterdeep. Look past what you're seeing and look at what the person is really like. Because there are some people in Skullport who are very lonely, but they're making a living at being very helpful. You can pay certain people in Skullport to give you a refuge to heal or to hide a safe house if you're being hunted. There are, there are actually one or two healing pools, magical healing pools, so it's sort of like your friends bring your maimed, burnt body because you fell 120 feet through the breath weapon of a dragon. You're fried and shattered, <laughs> and they keep you alive frantically with their magic, and they bring you there. And for the transmission of sufficient funds to a drow woman, she will look after you in a kindly manner as sort of like the best nurse you will ever have in the realms. And if you're nice to her, you will become one of her firm friends, which means it gets you a discount every time you return for more healing, because <laughs> she <laughs> still has to make money. But if you need to disappear for three or four months, she will put you up. That can be really handy. There isn't just one of one person like this. There's about six or seven rival people like that who use Skullport as a base. So that's the thing I'd like people to know. <laughs> And now for a new segment on Realm Speak, where we help you to conquer the unconquered names and things of the realms. This week, we're going to pronounce this. Klaus or Kloss. Both are correct for that huge red dragon that's going to eat you in about five seconds. And one of these drow nurses with the grotesque face. I can recall that her name is Numori. N-O-U-M-A-U-R-E-E. Numori. Now, that's probably a trade name. You know, like like an exotic dancer doesn't use their own name in our real world. They usually use a name that nobody will associate with their real name. So that's probably not her real name, but that's the name she's got.